Reading from the Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 7, we're doing texts 27 and 28 today. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Shri Bhagavan Uvacha. Ete dam drona putrasya. Brahmanastram pradarshitam. Naivasa veda sangharam. Rana badha upashtite. Shri Bhagavan Uvacha. Vete dam drona putrasya. Brahma mastram padarshatam. Naivasa veda sangharam. Rana badha upastite. Shri Bhagavan uvacha. Vete dam drona putrasya. Ramana Stram Padarshatam Naivasa Veda Samharam Pranabadha Upastite Sri Bhagavan, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Uvacha, said, Veta, just know from me, Idam, this, Drona Putrasha, of the son of Drona, Brahmanastram, hymns of the Brahma, nuclear weapon, Pradarshitam, Exhibited. exhibited. Na, no, not. not. Eva, Eva, even. even. Aso, Aso, he. he. Veda, Veda, know it. No, Sangharam, Sangharam, retraction. retraction. Pranabadhe, Pranabadhe, extinction of life. Upastite, being imminent. Translation and purport by His Divine Grace, Shri Prabhupada. The Supreme Personality of God had said, Know from me that this is the act of the son of Drona. He has thrown the hymns of nuclear energy, Brahmastra, and he does not know how to retract the glare. He has helplessly done this, being afraid of imminent death. Report. 
The Brahmastra is similar to the modern nuclear weapon manipulated by atomic energy. The atomic energy works wholly on total combustibility. And so the Brahmastra also acts. It creates an intolerable heat similar to atomic radiation. But the difference is that the atomic bomb is a gross type of nuclear weapon, whereas the Brahmastra is a subtle type of weapon produced by chanting hymns. It is a different science. And in days gone by, such science was cultivated in the land of Bharat Varsha. The subtle science of chanting hymns is also material, but is yet to be known by the modern material scientists. Subtle material, uh, subtle material science is not spiritual, but has a direct relationship with the spiritual method, which is still subtler. A chanter of hymns knows how to apply the weapon as well as how to retract it. That was perfect knowledge. But the son of Dronacharya, who made use of the subtle science, did not know how to retract. He applied it, being afraid of his imminent death, and thus the practice was not only improper, but also irreligious. As a son of a Brahmin, he should not have made so many mistakes and for such gross negligence of duty. He was to be punished by the Lord himself. I'll just read text 28. O Arjuna, only another Brahmastra can counteract this weapon. Since you are expert in the military science, subdue this weapon's glare for the power of your own weapon. Purport. For the atomic bombs, there is no counter weapon to neutralize the effects. But for the subtle science of action of a Brahmastra can be counteracted. And those who expert in military science in those days could counteract Brahmastra. The son of Dronacharya did not know the art of counteracting the weapon. And therefore, Arjuna was asked to counteract it by the power of his own weapon. Omagyana timrin disha gananjana selakaya shakshuni tamiyana tazma shri gurvena maha vanchako patru vishya kriva sindhivivacha paditeno pavani vyo vaishnivivacha maha. So we are in a very exciting part of this chapter, the battle of the Brahmastras between Arjuna and Ashvatthama. Uh, I've always thought this was a great story. I've always thought what a great movie it would be make, you know, with all the special effects they can do, yeah. with the shooting the arrows, there's nuclear energy. Anyway, it'd really be great, wouldn't it? <laughs> you know, I wish they would do that instead of all the other nonsense that they do. Anyway, uh, a great story. Um, and Prabhupada talks a little bit about the Brahmastra. He says it's similar to a nuclear bomb. Uh, it has a kind of effect, a devastating effect. But it's based on chanting mantras, not based upon... I was going to try some say some scientific explanation of atomic energy, uh, but I have no idea. So anyway, whatever they do <laughs> on a material basis um, is quite different. So Srila Prabhupada is describing here subtle science versus gross material science. And there's some very interesting points here. Because the nuclear weapon is very gross. It destroys everything, right? It just blows up everyone. It radiates everything. There's no discrimination between you know, a combatant or non-combatant, anything. It's just, it just blows up everything in its wake. Now, a Brahmastra is very different. First, it can be targeted. Remember the Brahmastra? Uh, later on, later, I think it's, is it this chapter, the next chapter? Probably this chapter, where uh, Ashwatthama shoots Brahmastra at Uttara and uh, where Parikita is in the womb. Think of that, a nuclear weapon that only goes into the womb of one person. I mean, that's how precise this was. Although we see here, Ashwatthama was not super tight. He knew how to, how to shoot Brahmastras. He knew how to release them, but he didn't know how to withdraw them. He had only partial knowledge. Arjuna, of course, was a much superior warrior. Arjuna was one of the best warriors at that time, ever. And he could not only know, he knew all the mantras to release these weapons, a variety of weapons. He had a whole quiver full of different, different ones, Brahmastra being one of the greatest ones, and he had other ones as well. He also knew how to withdraw them. So Krishna is asking him because Ashwatthama, just in his fear, has just wildly and recklessly shot off his Brahmastra that could blow up, you know, destroy the world. In other words, Prabhupada saying it's very reckless. He was not actually acting as a Brahmin or, or even as a Chatriya at this point. So uh, Krishna says to Arjuna, you have to withdraw this. You shoot your Brahmastra and withdraw his weapon. Now, not only, of course, they could be targeted, but they could be withdrawn. And that's very different. So, obviously, as Prabhupada is saying here, modern science is very unaware of the nature of subtle science. 
Uh, I would say probably the average scientist would read this and say this is some kind of fantasy or this is just some sort of, you know, like, uh, you know, like they do in these movies, you know, with all these, you know, the fantasy things, you know, it's like Lord of the Rings or something, you know. I, I don't know, but I mean, really, that's probably what they would think because they're so unaware of what goes on beyond just the interaction of gross material elements. One of the most interesting lines in this purport I found, which I was trying to figure out, Prabhupada says, subtle material science is not spiritual, but it has a direct relationship with the spiritual method, which is still subtler. So, as we go on, I'll try to understand this point a little bit, which is a very subtle point, of how subtle material is related to spiritual, although they're of two very different natures. So that's a very interesting point that we'll try to talk about. So what is, by the way, what is subtle? We're talking about, you're saying subtle all the time. Well, the dictionary definition is delicate or obscure, elusive or precise, very difficult to analyze or describe, right? So it's something not so easy to understand. Subtle means it's not gross. It's not something you easily just see and describe. It's something of a different nature. And again, of course, I mean, this is something, the concept is well known to everybody, but how this applies to spiritual life we are hearing from the Srimad Bhagavatam. So, I want to first do a little review of the elements. What's going on here with these different material elements? We know from the Vedas there are three divisions that we, I guess you could say substances. There's the gross material, there's the subtle material, and then there's the spiritual. And of course, Bhagavad Gita's seventh chapter describes these very clearly. So it says, earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intelligence, and false ego. These eight constitute my separated material energy. So in the purport, Sri the Prophet first describes the five gross elements. And then also, along with those five gross elements of water, of earth, water, fire, air, and ether, there's also five senses that correspond to them, and then the five objects of the senses. That's all part of the uh, gross material energy. And also, interestingly, they become progressively finer. In other words, water is finer than earth, fire is finer than water, ether is, and, you know, ether is the finest of the material elements. In fact, it's so fine that material scientists does not even recognize ether. You know? I remember uh, we had a, um, one of our devotee scientists was giving class one day, and, and this question came up. <laughs> and, you know, he was a physicist or chemist, and he says, he said, they actually, they don't know what ether is. They understand the other four, but there's no concept of space or ether as being an element, of being a substance, because it's so fine of even a gross element that they can't understand it. So that's kind of outside of their purview. You know, which, uh, I mean, because ether is very important, because what is carry, what is the, um, the sense that's connected with ether? Of the five senses or the five elements? Sound. Sound. Thank you, Seisha. Sound. And so sound vibration is carried throughout the ether, and we know sound vibration is practically the basis of spiritual life in Kali Yuga, right? The chanting the Hare Krishna mantra. It's, although it's spiritual, carried, sound is carried in the ether, so a very important element that they know nothing about. So Prabhupada said, then of course there's the three subtle elements, mind, intelligence, and false ego. They somewhat understand mind. I don't know if they... Clear, I don't know if even if psychologists clearly distinguish between mind and intelligence. I don't think so much. They have some sense of ego, you know, being identity, but in terms of a false ego, real identity, no, not so much, because they really think identity is connected with the mind and intelligence. So it's really, yeah, it's false ego. Prophet says material science comprises these ten items, five senses and sense objects and nothing more. But the other three items, mind, intelligence, and false ego, are neglected by the materialists. So even those subtle elements, they don't really understand very well. You know, there, there's, there's some study of the mind, um, philosophers the study of, you know, epistemology and things like that. They study in, in the mind and what is learning, what is knowledge. Psychologists try to understand the workings of the mind to some degree, but it's very crude by the standards of Vedic science, of Vedic knowledge. Now, of course, we have the, those, the elements, the material elements, both gross and subtle, and then the next verse of Bhagavad Gita 7.5 says, Besides these, O mighty armed Arjuna, there is another superior energy of mine, 
which comprises of the living entity who are exploiting the resources of this material inferior nature. So then we have the description of the living entity whose nature is spiritual. And then, of course, in the next verse, Krishna says, of all created beings, they have their source in these two natures. All that is material and all that is spiritual in this world know for certain that I am both the origin and the dissolution. So we have the gross material energy, we have the subtle material energy, we have the spiritual nature, which is the jiva, the atma, the living entity, and above all of these, of course, is Krishna. Krishna confirms that he is the source, he is the, you know, all of these energies are coming from him, they are controlled by him. So, um, Srimad Bhagavatam, um, interestingly, um, I, I was thinking about all the different chapters we covered as we went through the Srimad Bhagavatam, and um, I was actually really happy that we studied the whole 11th canto because there was just so much amazing material in there in the Uddhava Gita, you know. And, and I remember I was, I was thinking back, and I looked back at um, chapter 22 of the 11th canto. It was a description of the material elements. And the first, it begins with Uddhava's even, sometimes we talk about all these elements, even Uddhava's confused. He says, why are there different counts and configurations of material elements? Sometimes they're counted this way, some that. Even Uddhava is saying that, asking, asking Krishna. And there are, I, I remember I, I gave the class on, on that particular verse, and I, I went through different scriptures and went through the Veda base and looked. And at least once I found, sometimes the Bhagavatam gives that there are six elements, seven elements, eight elements, 16, 24, 25, 26, and I think even 28. So, you know, it depends on how you're describing these, but 24 elements is the one that's kind of most common, and Prabhupada often gives that. And um, why are these... Uh, I'll just uh, read this purport by Vishnu Chagavari Thakur, and that's about all I have to say about this. So the elements are included in other el that elements are included in other elements, as is explained further in two verses. Because the elements enter each other, they may be counted in their previous or latter condition. Some say the effects are in the cause, so they count the cause, previous element. Others say the cause is in the effects, so they count the effect in later elements. Thus there'll be either less or more elements in the counting. So it depends on how you group them, how you put them together. Like sometimes Prakriti is mentioned, sometimes Pradhana is given elements, sometimes they're both given as an element like that. So then I was thinking, well, why do we spend, why does the Bhagavatam spend so much time on this? You know, the third canto talks about this, the eleventh canto talks about this. Many chapters about the nature of material elements and creation, how this all comes about. Well, first we do need to understand how we are entangled to be able to come released from our entanglement. It's good to know how it's all working and how we're bound up in this network of material energy. Um, so what happens, of course, is that there's first this neutral state, unmanifested material energy called pradana. It's agitated by the glance of Krishna called the chit shakti. This creates the mahatattva. The 24 elements are part of that mahatattva. The that's are also a product or effect of the three gunas. Anyway, sometimes it's manifest, sometimes it's non-manifest. And verse 20 of that chapter says, through the Mahatattva, the jiva undergoes material existence. The creation and interaction comes through a hunkar. So Prabhupada said, this is 3.10.15, of the nine creations, the first one is the creation of the Mahatattva, or the sum total of the material ingredients where the modes interact due to the presence of the Supreme Lord. In the second, you know, there's all these different creations, different steps for material creation. The second part, the false ego is generated in which the material ingredients, material knowledge, and material activities arise. The prophet said this false ego is the cause of identifying the body and mind with the soul proper. Material resources and the capacity and knowledge to work are all generated in the second creation after the Mahatattva. So the ahankara is really the sort of the point where the pure soul entering into this material world touches matter. That's where our identification with matter begins because the soul could not do any activity in this material world without identifying with it. We have to first identify with this material energy, identify with the material body, accept the material body, or how could we be here? We'd still be in the spiritual world serving Krishna. And in fact, uh, I was just, remember uh, one purport Vishwanath said that the law of material nature is 
Um, there is no creation of a body until there's a soul that wants to enter into it. I mean, basically, it's the desire and the living entity is really the cause of the whole material creation. And then the false ego propels all of this, puts us all into motion. So, how is the subtle energy and the subtle body connected to the spiritual energy, as Srila Prabhupada was saying in this purport? Prabhupada said, the subtle material science is not spiritual, but has a direct, direct relationship with the spiritual method, which is still more subtle. Well, I was trying to think about that, because I, I can't say 100% understand it. I think it's a very deep point. And there's probably a lot of different perspectives on it, but here's a few things I was thinking about to try to how to understand that. First, I was thinking about, well, what are the subtle elements, uh, the mind, intelligence, and ego? Prabhupada says intelligence is next door to the spirit soul, right? In other words, the purified intelligence is very close to the spirit soul. And Prabhupada says real intelligence is differentiating spirit from matter. So you can see how the intelligence, how that subtle energy is very close to spiritual understanding. The mind, mind I think is a little bit farther away, but the Bhagavad Gita tells us the mind is the best friend or the worst enemy. For most of us it's usually our worst enemy, but it can be our best friend when the mind is fixed on Krishna, on devotional service. So the mind can also be very connected, that subtle energy can be connected with spiritual. And the false ego, ego, ego basically means identity. So there's two identities that we sort of alternate between. Ahankara, false ego, which is thinking that I am this body, I am this mind, and our real identity, our real sarup, which is the servant of Krishna. You know, we have a real identity. So if that false entity, false ego, that identity can be transformed through the process of Krishna consciousness, of bhakti yoga, to real identity, then one realizes one's real nature. I was also thinking that many of the spiritual arts and practices that we do in the material world depend upon the subtle energy. So we're in this material world, but we're trying to perform devotional service. And what do we have to work with? We have this material body. We have both gross and subtle elements of this body. And so, first of all, Vedic mantras operate on the subtle level, not the gross. Prabhupada uh, gives the description here of the Brahmastra weapon. He said the Brahmastra weapon is subtle energy. It's not spiritual, but yet it's used by great pure devotees like Arjuna for serving Krishna. Ayurvedic medicine often uses mantras, subtle energy, to cure diseases. And the Brahmins, very realized Brahmins, often would, would serve as doctors, and they would use these, these mantras for medical cures. And of course, mantras such as the Hare Krishna mantra are called spiritual sound vibration. So material sound is used, but it has a spiritual effect. Krishna transforms the material to spiritual. And spiritual realization or perfection of life means that one transforms the gross body, the subtle body, to a spiritual body, both in this life and the next. Of course, we want to be able to get out of this material world, to be able to rid ourselves of this material body, take a spiritual body and serve Krishna in the spiritual world. But even in this life, one can, one's body can be spiritualized. Srila Prabhupada's gross and subtle body was totally spiritual. Why? Because of service to Krishna, of dedicating everything to the service of Krishna. And uh, a person like that has been called uh, Jiva Mukta, one who is liberated even in this material world, even in this material life, having a body of material and subtle elements. One is liberated because all of those elements, everything in one's body, mind, intelligence, all one's work is used to serve Krishna. Therefore, it's no longer material. It's kind of a subtle point because it's one of those Achinta Veda Veda points, you know, of philosophy, of simultaneous oneness and difference, because we're not impersonal, so we don't say, oh, material and spiritual ultimate is all one. No, there is an eternal variegatedness that is there. Krishna's variegated energies are eternal. But at the same time, it's we, the devotee, as one gains realization, a pure devotee understands that all energies are coming from Krishna, 
everything is for Krishna. How is anything different from Krishna? So we understand, we, an advanced devotee, I should say, understands everything is Krishna's energy. It doesn't matter whether it's gross, subtle, or spiritual. It's coming from Krishna and to be used by Krishna. And that doesn't mean that it all merges into one amalgamated mass of energy or some impersonal conception like that. No, the variety remains. Individuality remains. All of this is there. The great variety, individuality, and very gatedness of Krishna's spiritual world and of the material world. But the devotee understands the source of all those energies and how to use those energies in Krishna's service. So we want to transform the body, particularly the subtle body. We want, to, we, want to, we want to actually break the identification with the subtle body because that's often our greatest impediment to spiritual life. It's often easier to break the identification with the gross body. You know, especially the older you get, the more you think, boy, I'm glad I'm not my body. You know, but, uh, <laughs> you know, the body gives us nothing but trouble. So we can kind of see that. We understand uh, that I am within this body and I'm different, but it's more difficult to break the identification with a subtle body. We often, you know, sometimes we think what, I, what my mind is thinking or my intelligence, this is me. No. And uh, so because of false ego, we see these things as the self. So that's a little more difficult. And that requires the process of bhakti yoga, the transformation of a subtle body to spiritual. There's a nice verse in the Bhagavatam, 32533, because just as digestion of food requires no separate effort, liberation automatically accompanies attainment of bhakti. That sounds nice, doesn't it? You know, just do bhakti yoga and just let my food digest. Um, there's a nice, uh, I'll read a commentary uh, about the transformation of the subtle body. By, uh, uh, did I lose that? Let's see. Try another file here. Okay, anyway, um, this is from Srila Prabhupada's uh, Beyond Illusion and Doubt. This is one of his older works, I think he, before he came to America. Because of our ignorance of the spiritual body, of which we have no experience, we do not know of the activities of the spiritual body. If by Krishna's grace, we act in our spiritual body, we can transcend both the gross and subtle bodies. In other words, we can gradually train ourselves to act in terms of the spiritual body. Narada Pancharatma says, Rishikena, Rishikesha, Sevanam Bhakta Devotional service means engaging the spiritual body and spiritual senses in the service of the Lord. When they are thus engaged in such activities, the actions and reactions of the gross and subtle body cease. In 4.22.25, the Bhagavatam says, the devotee should gradually increase the culture of devotional service by constant hearing of the transcendental qualities of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. These pastimes are like ornamental decorations on the ears of the devotee. By rendering devotional service and transcending the material qualities, one can easily be fixed in transcendence of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So that, that process is there. Verse which I lost. Okay. Um, Krishna Jagavari Tukur describes the process of this uh, using this metaphor of digestion and how just as the subtle body, or just as in the gross body, food is digested, and what happens? The uh, good elements, the nutritious elements, the you know, are kept, they're retained to give the body strength. And those things which are not needed, which are waste, are eliminated. So in the same way, Vishnu says that the subtle body is dissolved. But what that means is, he says, the good elements remain. In other words, those aspects of, that we, of, our, of our senses, those aspects of the subtle body, the mind intelligence, which are used to serve Krishna, those remain. 
It's not that all of a sudden everything that we know and have is just like obliterated. That's kind of an impersonal understanding. And no. In other, in other words, who we are and what we have and what we can do and we can offer, that will remain. But those, but those things which are negative, which are material, which take us away from Krishna, those dissolve little by little. And it doesn't happen all at once. Now, I'll end with this last quote where Vishnu says, talks about how it's a gradual process. He says, just as the fire of digestion from the moment the food is eaten begins digesting it, but completes the process after nine or 12 hours, so from the beginning of the devotional service, bhakti begins to destroy material life in the form of lamentation and illusion, but completes the process of destruction only after some time. Thus, even at the stage of practice, when lamentation and illusion have not been destroyed, one should not consider the devotee to be in samsara. In other words, taking repeated births and deaths, the devotee is considered to be in a liberated stage as soon as one seriously takes up the process of devotional service following the instructions of the spiritual master. So even though it will take some time, just as it takes some hours to digest food, it may take us some years or maybe even some lifetimes to complete the process. The process is nevertheless going on and it's going on in a way that will not be stopped. As long as we have some sincerity to remain in devotional service, Krishna and the spiritual master will continue to purify us, dissolving the unwanted aspects of the subtle body and the tendencies of the gross body so that we become unalloyed devotees of Krishna in the end. Okay. Thank you very much. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Oh, are there? Sheshapur? Just an update on modern weaponry. They do have very pow powerful bombs now that can be directed to specific pinpointed locations. So the, the gross aspect of the first atomic bombs have been um, surpassed by military scientists. I didn't quite get that out. You can take your mask down. <laughs> I think it's muffled a little. <laughs> I was saying that the science of weaponry has, has advanced to the point now where they have bombs, very powerful bombs, that can be pinpointed to a particular location and uh, not be grossly destructive as we see on the reading. Oh, I'm glad they made some real advancement <laughs> then. <laughs> they, they can direct their weapons better. Yeah, that's true. I, I, think they, I think they can. I don't know about nuclear weapons, though. <laughs> they still have pretty... Yeah, and, but they can't, can't withdraw those, I don't think. Yeah, I don't know, maybe they can. Yeah. Yeah, yeah well, they are getting better and better at killing people, that's true. Yeah. Not so good, though, at um, dispensing spiritual knowledge. Anything else? Frank of I remember in Jaiva Dharma, Bhaktivinoda Thakur explains that um, misuse of free will caused the soul to be allured by the external allurement of the energy. At that time, an ego that binds the soul, which is consciousness, cannot be bound actually. Mm -hmm. But because his attraction to the allurement has the potency for the external energy to bind the soul with the dead matter, whether subtle or gross, both. And that is the birthplace of false ego. Uh -huh. And everything began from there. Yeah, and that connection. Yeah, I've always found this to be a very subtle point, actually. When you think about it, we say the soul is covered, or the soul is an illusion, but yet the soul is always full of knowledge, right? The soul is, the soul is really never connected, but at the same time it is connected. You know, it's, it's definitely a subtle point of philosophy. Yeah, that's a nice explanation, thank you. Yeah. Yes. There is a question not related to this, but it says, uh, I'll just read it exactly. Uh, says, uh, what about the person giving class? Should they wear mask? 
Uh, that's been one of our exceptions because it's really hard to speak for 30 minutes with a, with a mask on. Actually, uh, even the people in the audience, if you're spaced far enough off and you're not speaking, you don't have to wear masks, like you said this morning. Hmm. Oklahoma so. Prabhu is asking that last class or last Friday, the five sons of Draupadi that Ashwatthama killed, hmm. is there any details about their identity, who they are, where they come? I mean, like. You know, I was thinking about that the other day, and I realized I don't know. Maybe you know Prangavinda, who the five sons were? Because they don't really name them in the Bhagavatam, do they? Maybe it's in the Mahabharata. Mahabharata has the name. Mahabharata probably has yes. it. I, I don't know myself. I mean, like, uh, I don't know, it takes like about an hour to give the story. Like, for an example... <laughs> oh, don't, don't take an hour to give the story. I'll just take this one example, like Abhimanyu. Abhimanyu. Everybody talks about it. Yeah. So Prabhupada also mentioned, Abhimanyu is actually son of a moon god, Soma. Mm. Mm. So because Krishna revealed that to Brahmaji, that all of you, demigod, take birth in Vrindavan, Dwarka, and join in the family of mm. Krishnis, Jadavas, and ha join in my uh, fighting against the demons. Mm. So they all took birth. The Soma and uh, his son, they were in love one day and uh, hugging and talking, father and son, then says, Oh no, we have to go there. So he said, Go and come back to That birth and coming back was exact time and it appears like, oh, it's cruel. Even Prabhupada says that uh, Subhadra did not accuse Krishna, knowing that Krishna is the cause of everything, including her own son's death. Knowing that, mm -hmm. but did not. But out of affection, Krishna spent time uh, with the sister more than usual uh, and pacified her. So I guess the nourishment of the emotional uh, relationship was exhibiting, not really. But because Krishna knew that in, in another angle to look at it, okay, he went and came back to his father. That's normal. Like we go to market and come back or something like that. So that's how Abhimanyu just left the moon planet, came and took birth. God talking about Abhimanyu, right? Yeah. yeah. So he was uh, only 16, right, when he was killed or something yeah, like that? Very young. Normal. In fact, it was considered a great disgrace. It was like, what, eight or ten Maharatis all kind of ganged up on him, surrounded yeah. him, you know, and... and uh, he could not come out. Yeah, and that, but it took all of them. He was such a great warrior, practically, even at 16 years old. Correct. Yeah, and so he was the son of the moon guy. Okay. Well, we he, learned a lot of things that, like, for example, the mother should not fall asleep when they hear Bhagavatam. Because the son, he knew how to, how to, how to, he did not know how to come out because to go in and to come out, both were revealed to him, but his mother fell asleep and the baby was sleeping also. Mm. So many things we learned from this. Little yeah, little. yeah, I'm sure there's all sorts of stories and backstories. <laughs> yeah. They're really quite amazing. But, uh, yeah, I didn't know that one. Okay. There is, a, there is a little uh, Another one? comments. Okay. From Mother Nandini Kishori. Upanan Upananda was they are prati binda oh yeah the name is given here in the chat room so Kilananda Prabhu can see it. Okay, the said the names are given? The names of the the five Ashwatthama that killed the Pandava children. Huh. Do we have them there or in the chat room? What's that? In the chat. It's there. Oh, okay. So they can see. Okay. What, what, what chapter, what verse is it? Uh, this is uh, just a YouTube, Ishkan Alachwal. Uh, hmm. Okay. I'm just wondering, are, are, are they named in a particular verse or part of the Bhagavatam? No, no, just, just the five sons' name. Okay. From somewhere. <laughs> we don't know the source. All right, thank you very much. I'll go to Shri Prabhupada. Yeah. Suta Soma, Suta Karma, 
Satang Satanika and Sutasena. <laughs>